Hello, lab experts. Welcome to the Rock Diagnostics Podcast, the podcast where we discuss everything medical laboratory science in Africa and around the world. In this episode, we're doing something different. We're going to have an interview, the very first interview that we've ever done on this channel. And we're going to be interviewing David McClasson, medical laboratory scientist extraordinaire, who was engrossed in a case back in the 1980s that would lead to the conviction of killer nurse Jenin Jones, a nurse that was involved in killing children back in Texas. Without further ado, let's talk MedLab. Once again, welcome. Thanks for being here. As I was saying earlier, today we were talking about a case that involves medical laboratory science, but with a little twist on it. Today we're talking about David McGlasson, medical scientist from Texas, who was, like I said earlier, in the right place at the right time when gruesome murders were happening in the medical, the hospital system. I'll let him present himself and then we'll try and go into the case. We'll talk to him about how he got, how he got involved into this case, um, what experience allowed him to know what tests to ask for due as the problems were starting to be discovered and how his experience in medical laboratory science allowed him to help the investigators figure out what was actually happening. So, David, I'll let you introduce yourself to the viewers. Thank you, Robertson. Um, my name is David McGlasson. I am a clinical research scientist who is semi-retired. Uh, I mostly write and uh, give presentations now, but I had a 50-year career in both the clinical and the research side of the medical lab science field. Um, the case that we're going to be talking about today is Robertson described the Janine Jones serial killer uh, nurse, as we called her. Um, in fact, uh, if you are a fan of Stephen King, the horror writer and uh, his movies, the book and the movie Misery, he used Janine as the template for the killer nurse, psychotic nurse in that uh, uh, book and movie. Um, but in the early 80s, I was working at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio when the uh, and I was running the hemostasis and flow cytometry labs. And I was also, the, like a lot of uh, medical lab personnel, you work two jobs when you got kids in a mortgage. And um, uh, I was also the evening supervisor of the laboratory at the teaching hospital connected with the medical school, which is now called University Health Systems. And uh, I was confronted when I was back in the laboratory by a frantic intern who had some blue tubes in his hand. I thought, okay, coag problem coming up. And I said, yes, sir, can I help you? And he goes, yeah. He said, you guys' lab tests are all screwed up and we need to find out what's going on. And he had, I said, what do you got? And he had a program in time and a PTT that were greater than 60 seconds and greater than 120 seconds. And I said, it looks like heparin. He said, it can't be heparin. The kid's not getting any heparin. And I said, okay, is he in DIC then? No, but he is bleeding out of every pore and I need to know what's going on. And I said, all right, so uh, I turned to my uh, one of my really good techs, a gentleman named Pete Gamboa, who is now one of the supervisors at the uh, VA or Veterans Affairs Hospital in San Antonio. I said, Pete, give me a reptilase time and a thrombin time. Reptilase comes from a, a snake genus called uh, Bothrops atrox, and uh, they both have the same effect like thrombin does with antithrombin, but the uh, um, reptilase time is insensitive to uh, heparin and the thrombin time is very sensitive to it. So we ran the tests and the reptilase time was normal and the thrombin time was, it never clotted. We went up to 300 seconds. And I still didn't believe me. And I, I eventually said, okay, look at this. Here's the package insert. Here's what it says when you have these two tests come up this way, he goes, I don't understand. And I said, well, uh, if you want to go back and, and get another sample, but I said, I suggest you go back to the floor and start pumping in some protamine sulfate. And then I didn't think anything more about it. The next day at my regular job, I was uh, uh, a pathology resident by the name of Dr. Alan Northcutt brought in some plasma samples and he was with a security guard 
from the medical center hospital. And he says, Dr. Montiel, who was my boss, Dr. Milka Montiel, God rest her soul. Uh, she's no longer with us, but she's the one that picked me and got me started in the field of uh, special coagulation. And she said, David, I want you to use all your skill and find out how much heparin is involved with this child's samples. And I said, well, nobody quantifies this stuff. Uh, very few people in the early 80s that were doing it. I said, but I know where I can find the procedure to do it. And I went to a textbook by Dr. Douglas Triplett, who was like the coag guru of the world at that time. And I knew him and I pulled out the method. I validated it in a, a day and a half. And then I ran the patient's samples and a normal range for heparin therapeutic value. And this was a one month old child, mind you, is normal range for anybody is 0.3 to 0.7 uh, uh, units per ml of uh, heparin. This kid, had, um, if I remember correctly, it was something like 14.1. Uh, which would have been enough to anticoagulate a 250 pound man for over 24 hours. So this is why the kid was bleeding. And it wasn't the first time this had happened to this child. And a lot of other suspicious things happened up there, which I'll go into a little bit later. But um, so this was, and then the samples were then sent to a specialty uh, coagulation lab called Colorado Coagulation Consultants, who, I found out later uh, uh, was a very good friend of mine, uh, was the uh, supervisor and actually the owner of it, Gordon Enns, who was very prominent in the coagulation field. And he had a, a, a great uh, technologist named George Fritzma, who now has a blog called Fritzma Factor and uh, uh, is my co-author on several papers. They got the same results I did. So it was definite that it was an overdose heparin. How it got there, it had to be deliberate. Now, um, it really caused a lot of problems. Um, if I hadn't been there at the time and know what type of test to run on the samples that we had received and on the new samples, and the fact that I've been doing special hemostasis for a number of years, put me right at the center of this investigation. Okay, we found heparin, we know it's there. Uh, there were other cases of children who uh, were uh, overdosed with glucose, um, dilantin, uh, calcium, um, and it created a large, <laughs> it was just creating a large problem for the hospital because here are these kids, and it was on the three to 11 shift, they started calling it the death shift. And it was started to be linked to one nurse. And they had a hard time figuring out what to do with her. Um, I had to testify, wind up testifying in front of the grand jury in Bear County and San Antonio. And then uh, and, uh, I also had to uh, testify at the criminal trial. And I had to go through a lot of stuff with this. Um, for example, um, the defense team, when she was finally brought to trial in San Antonio, and I'll jump back in a minute to uh, what she did up in Kerrville, Texas. Um, but um, the defense team of this nurse used a young lady who I'd graduated from college with to try to get grand jury information out of me. And when I called the uh, uh, district attorney's office uh, saying what was going on, he said, don't answer the phone. I go, I have to answer the phone. I'm on call. He said, have your wife make sure who it is. We didn't have cell phones. <laughs> so... I had to go through that. And uh, the day that I was um, uh, testifying at the criminal trial, 2020, the news uh, show, not the year, but the news show that was on. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure you guys are glad this past year is over, almost as much as we are. But um, uh, the news people there, and I didn't want to be on TV because um, witnesses had been threatened by families of children that had been hurt saying, you guys better testify right or there'll be consequences. That was the first time that the Bear County uh, Courthouse started checking for weapons, guns, knives, anything that could be used as a weapon. And you had to go through metal detectors. That trial in this case is what caused that. Now, the hospital district hemmed and hawed around on this about what to do about this nurse. And, you know, they kept, they asked for legal advice and, and should we go to the uh, 
uh, the uh, district attorney with this to ask for a criminal uh, investigation. And they kept delaying it. The nurses kept, the supervisor nurses kept covering up for her. And finally, one courageous nurse named Pat Velko stepped up and said, I know this is happening. She started documenting it and people were retaliating against her. Uh, there was a very uh, good uh, 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 intensivist named Jim Robotham who was specialized in uh, pediatric intensive care. And uh, he kept bringing up concerns. And again, nothing was done. Well, they finally figured out a way to get rid of her. Um, they um, um, cited, she was an LBN. They said only RNs will be working on the unit now. And so she left. One of the doctors, the pediatricians, got a good recommendation from uh, the, her supervisors and took her with her up to Kerrville, Texas. Now, in the meantime, CDC came in and questioned me and several others. And uh, like I said, a lot of things happened. All this stuff happened on the 3 to 11 shift. So, and I was the supervisor. So I was also responsible for the lab work that came out uh, from them. The elevated uh, uh, dilatin level. In fact, this is very interesting. Um, let me back up a little bit. This person was supposed to get out of jail in 2018. This happened in 19, she was sentenced finally for the last time in 1984. Texas had some very strange laws at the time yeah. to prevent jail overcrowding. They just decided to give people a, a day off for every good day they put in. So she was only serving half of her sentence. And she was supposed to get out in um, 2018 after serving 35, a little over, you know, almost 35 years. And they said, uh-uh, this didn't happen. And so they tried her on four other cases. And they brought me in again to review the patient samples. Also, I'd worked up one other child and also found there was an overdose of heparin in that one. When I was looking over the data, I found on the... Uh, Person, uh, the child that had a dilantin level uh, that was uh, around 10, four hours later, it was 60. And what they didn't notice was that uh, his blood glucose went from 112 up to 598. And yeah, a super critical value. And uh, the, DA, the DAs uh, said, how can that happen? I said, it's, it's on purpose is how it happened. I said, there's no other explanation for that. I said, even drawing it through an IV line, you're not going to see something like that. And uh, uh, the three, and then another time, um, another tech of mine had a uh, glucose level on another subject that was 500. Now, these three guys that ran these tests for me, one of them is now a pathologist, one of them is an oral surgeon, and Greg Bowers is a uh, uh, internal medicine specialist. And he was a, a kid who was working for me part-time uh, while he was in the Air Force. And then while he went to medical school, his first two years still worked with us. And uh, in fact, I saw him the night in the ER. Uh, I went down there to check on our ER lab and um, or emergency center lab, they call it now to be politically correct, I guess. And I went down and uh, said, how's it going tonight? He said, man, I got this kid He's only like two years old. He's got glucose over 500, and he has no signs of being diabetic at all. I don't know what's going on. And he had been up in the ICU, discharged, and brought back almost immediately because of his actions. So with the skills that I was able to acquire over the years, I was able to track this down. I was able to quantify the heparin that was involved in it. And that, like I said, that was the center of the case where they said something needs to be done. Getting ready to go to criminal trial is a very, very tough thing to do because you don't know, they, they are going to attack your credibility as much as they possibly can. The medical school provided me with an attorney to go over what could possibly be happening. Uh, and uh, she actually sat in the back of the room while I was testifying and I was also testifying there were three uh, uh, physicians there and pathologists who were checking out what I had to say so they could testify later as expert witnesses. But um, um, she sat in the back of the room and she said, I'll shake my head, yes, 
you know, for you to go ahead and answer. And if they get into an area that's kind of weird, you, know, the like this, you just say, I'm sorry, I don't have that information. And the defense team did everything that they could to rattle me, but uh, it didn't work. But with the issues that I've had with research and the clinical side, I was able to really work with the prosecution several times, uh, as a matter of fact. But, you know, one of them, uh, a guy who is not with us uh, any longer, uh, uh, Art Brogley, was a lead investigator on it. And he'd been a, uh, uh, an Air Force OSI officer, uh, which are the police for the Air Force investigator uh, for 30 years. And I said, Mr. Brogley, I said, you said that they're going to go after more medical personnel who didn't do what they were supposed to, right? He said, yes, that's right. So why didn't you go after the lawyers who gave the bad advice? Uh, well, I work for lawyers, so um, I thought, oh, that makes it okay then, huh? And uh, uh, in fact, uh, he was on a show, a talk show later after another book came out on this, uh, and uh, I called in to ask him that question, and the host jumped on that immediately, and uh, Art said, I know who that is. He, his name is David McGlasson. He did a heck of a job for us with the, his record keeping and his lab work and uh, his testimony made it possible for us to convict this person. And he said, uh, he got me there. He said, I, I work for lawyers. And they said, we did not think of going after them. And maybe we should have. I said, they were covering up uh, um, evidence. So let me take you a little bit through what uh, Janine's history was. She was fired after eight months for patient abuse. And yet that didn't follow her. To university hospital in her second job at a place and is now uh, uh, a, an emergency hospital. She was asked to leave after she kept getting elective surgeries done with no sick leave or vacation accrued. And they just said, we can't keep letting you off like this. We have to fill a position. Her third position in, in 13 months was at Bear County Hospital on the 311 PDICU uh, shift and it was called the death shift. Now, CDC found that if you were a patient on the 3 to 11 shift and you had nurse 19, they numbered all the nurses that worked there. If you had nurse 19, you had a 48 times greater chance of dying than with any other nurse on any other shift. Staggering, isn't it? Now, the bad thing is she was pretty good at what she did. Her uh, supervisor thought she was great. Yeah, however, she in her first year, which is her probationary year, she was noted to have eight critical errors of wrong dosing, of uh, bad flow rates, um, of IVs, a lot of things like that. She only received informal counseling, no formal reprimands. Um, she was forced to go to retraining, refused and blamed it on others, and was, was then uh, counseled and insubordinate to higher level nurses. Um, and the supervisor again protected her. The next time she showed up one, uh, drunk on an off shift and was messing with IV equipment. And she was ordered to leave by the house staff and should have been suspended for endangering patients, but she was allowed to continue. Again, they kept going to the supervisors and they kept going to the, um, um, the uh, uh, lawyers and they kept denying it. They didn't want to deal with the problem. I'm sure you've all had to deal with there's always a problem employee that they always seem to let get away with stuff and always have you always have to work around and then they'll go after the good employees. It's just amazing to me. I've seen it in many places. So other personnel couldn't figure out how she was getting uh, away with this stuff. During her first 27 months of employment, she made over 30 visits to county uh, outpatient clinics and uh, the emergency center for problems. Now, Finally, she was diagnosed with uh, having, uh, after all this was done, she, uh, they said she had Munchausen syndrome by proxy. The Baron Munchausen was a old radio character back in the 30s who would tell these whopping lies and tales and always make it seem like it was true. And he loved attention, just like this person did. But a personal experience I had with her, and I knew her, um, she had taken care of a colleague of mine's uh, son who'd been uh, hurt very bad, who's only 15 years old, who was hurt very badly in a car he was riding in. 
and was in the ICU for uh, a month. And uh, the uh, uh, PhD and his wife said, we're really glad that one of us was always there with Gary because we, when we found out later ab about Janine and what she did to people, we were absolutely stunned. But I had a case one night when I was on and we got a heads up that there was a family coming in. The children had gotten into their mother's hypnotics, drugs she was taking, and they thought they were M&Ms or Skittles and because they were funny colors and stuff. So they were coming in with these overdoses. And I said, OK, at that time, we didn't have toxicology run um, uh, um, on that type of medication. We used uh, an old phoretic technique called a toxigram. But we had to toxicologists on call. I said, I'll call my people. They'll be in in 30 minutes. I want blood, urine, and gastric on each of the kids. OK, my people got in. No specimens. I waited 10 more minutes. I called the floor and they were confused. I went up to the PDICU and walked in and Janine was the first one to me. She said, I said, where are my specimens? I said, I've got text downstairs ready to go. We need to get this done. And she says, what do you need? What do you need? I told her I had it in 10 minutes. She went and got it. She was really hyped up and amped in this situation. And she got the samples for us. And so that's one example of what she was. Now she was somebody who was, um, uh, she was a control freak. She loved a crisis. If something didn't happen, she would create it. She asked for and got the sickest kid. And when the kid would pass away, she would be the one that would prepare them to go to the morgue and she would bathe them and sing to them while she was working. Hey, that's a strange personality uh, right there. And if she didn't get the six kids, she would raise the heck. Now she turned the patient's families. She cussed like a drill sergeant, the co-workers. She loved the attention. She questioned everyone's decisions. And would, we found out later she would sabotage uh, interns' orders. Uh, Dr. Debbie Roush, who I got to know extremely well through a, a child of mine, uh, uh, caught her pushing calcium on a kid one day that didn't need it. Um, Dr. Robotham, who was, a, a, as I mentioned earlier, who was a top-notch uh, uh, physician from Johns Hopkins and graduated from med school, like in the top two of his class. Johns Hopkins is a very prominent medical uh, institution in the States. Um, wanted to make, you know, he thought Janine was just dedicated. Um, a patient named Chris Hogeda, um, she left the bed open one time with, and he had all of the, uh, he was hooked up to uh, uh, machines, had IVs all over the place, and fell out of the bed, and she blamed it on somebody else bumping the bed. Uh, and he had, and for some reason, he also was having strange and irregular heartbeats, and we didn't know exactly what was causing it. Um, uh, we checked him for, he was a person that we checked for heparin also, because he had some suspicious bleeds, but um, uh, the, sample had normal, the samples had normalized uh, by the time we got to him. Now, um, over the next four months, the deaths kept going up and up and up. And my boss and I kept saying, you know, is this, a, is this problem something to do with someone not knowing what's going on with heparin? Heparin is uh, one of the biggest overdose problems that you can have. And it's gotten better uh, now that we label things according to the concentration of them. And you have to sign them out just like you would a narcotic. And um, if you read my uh, blog on Clot Club, I write a whole, I write a whole article uh, on this, on Heparin in the News, about Janine. And also, if you uh, have ever heard of the American actor Dennis Quaid, he's appeared in a lot of things, including The Right Stuff and, oh, just a, a number of movies. He's got a brother named Randy, who's also an actor. His twins were overdosed at UCLA, UC uh, Los Angeles, at Cedars of Sinai, which is one of the best institutions in the States, where three pharmacists made errors and three nurses made errors on dosing, and his twins almost bled to death. They were given 10,000 units per ml flushes in their IVs instead of 10 units. Can you believe that? It was unbelievable. But we'd had a case, we'd had some cases about six months before this started where we had people that were developing heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, 
And I was the first person in Texas to also do those too, using an old platelet aggregation technique uh, at the time. And we said, why are we getting so many? And we finally traced it back to a first year intern who had a, a resident that was just a complete jerk that would berate him for everything. And the person was flushing IV lines with a uh, hundred uh, uh, unit uh, uh, per ml instead of ten, and because he was and he was afraid to ask the guy, you know, he was using uh, like ten thousand units and diluting it down, and he thought he was supposed to use a hundred, and it was causing these people to become sensitized to it, and they developed the problems with heparin induced thrombocytopenia, uh, and uh, so it was. We thought it was something like that going on. Yeah, I mean, you just can't imagine a medical person. You go into that field for a reason to help people. You can't imagine somebody doing these bad things, and especially to your most innocent babies in the PDICU. Now, I will tell you from a personal standpoint, I had a child in that ICU later, and uh, I guess it was, uh, oh, 1980, yeah, in December of 83, uh, when I first went to work for the military. Uh, he went in because of a severe allergy problem, and uh, the personnel in that time, by that time, were all RNs. They knew me as the lab supervisor. They knew my connection to the Janine Jones case. We got really great care. We got Mercedes Benz care uh, in there, and we can't thank them enough. And, and my, my son now is 37 years old and uh, can bench press or, or deadlift 500 pounds. So he grew up to be a big, strong kid and uh, has been a success in his career in the computer industry. So lab experts, I hope you were able to learn a lot during this interview. As you saw, David talked, uh, talked about the Janine Jones case, how he got engrossed into it. He talked about also errors, medical errors he's seen throughout his career. This was the first part of the interview. We're going to have a second part in which we're going to ask questions that will go a little more deeply into the case and why things happened the way that they did. If you have any questions, remember, ask them in the comment section so that we can add them to the list of questions we already have. And also, you can read his blog, Heparin, in the news. We'll add the link also below so that you can check into it. Make sure you come back and also share this video because it's important for people to know about this, to know about the importance of medical, the medical laboratory science field and how even in a case such as a criminal investigation, it could be important to have medical laboratory scientists helping out. Thank you and see you next time.